pardon me. Judge Joe Benavides is a retired gunnery sergeant and decorated combat veteran from the United States Marine Corps. Hoorah. <laughs> Judge Benavides has earned a long list of medals, some which include the Combat Action Ribbon, Engaged Firefight in Al Wafra, Kuwait, uh, the Kuwait Liberation Medal, the National Defense Service Medal, the Southwest Asia Service Medal, and the Navy and Marine Corps Com Commendation Medal, times two. Judge Benavides is actively involved with the youth community to help make sure they stay in school. Would you do us the honor, sir, of leading us in the pledge? Absolutely. Thank you so Thank much. You. Uh, if everyone could please place their hand on their, right heart, on their heart and repeat after me or recite with me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. you thank you, Judge. Seated. Really appreciate you. Thank you, sir. God thank bless you for your service. Yes. Yes, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> Ms. Madiso, will you please call the roll? Dan Lyadecker. Here. Ana Jimenez. Lynn Allison. Here. Gabby Ganale. Beatrice Trottle. Here. Jeremy Coleman. Armando Gonzalez. Here. Erica Mamie. Aaron Munoz. Here. Eloy Salazar. Here. Matt Wilbright. Mr. Chair, we have a Thank you, ma'am. Uh, uh, agenda item three, safety bri briefing. John? Good morning, everyone. My Good name morning. is John. Um, my name is John Esparza. I'm the safety and security administrator here for the CCRTA, and today I'll be giving you a short safety briefing. In the event of an emergency, we will exit the boardroom to my right, to your left, proceed to the west stairwell, down to the first floor, where you will exit through the west side doors. Once outside, we will continue to the clock tower adjacent to the transfer station. Marisa will account for all the board members. I will be the last one out to ensure that everyone gets out safely. A few things to remember, please do not use the elevator. Please do not return until the auctor has been given. And if we need to shelter in place, we will do so in the west side stairwell. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, agenda item four, uh, receipt a conflict of interest affidavits. There were none received. Thank you, ma'am. All right, opportunity for public comment. Just a reminder, you got a three minute limit uh, and the board cannot discuss anything with you, but we'd love to hear from you. Any, uh, any public was, comment? There was one submitted online, which a copy is provided to board members and those will be reflected in the minutes. And we do have one signed up in person, Mariah Boone with Vulnerable Communities Defense League. Ms. Mariah, will you please come forward? Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. Um, I have come several times now, and keep coming, to ask that you put on the agenda a discussion to remove the hostile architecture that y'all have installed on your bus benches, which um, research has shown that communities that have hostile architecture have increased amounts of hate crime against the homeless. It creates a an environment of disrespect where people who are unhoused are treated like they're not people. Um, and I've asked several times, it hasn't shown up on the agenda for your board meetings yet. I really hope that you will prioritize this issue and put it on your next board meeting agenda to have a discussion about this. Um, it's, it's very important that our community stop treating our unhoused brothers and sisters in the way they've been treating. And the, the hostile architecture that's been installed by the RTA contributes to the community attitudes that cause all of the abuse that is happening to our unhoused brothers and sisters. So I hope that you will put that on the agenda for your next board meeting because we really need to have a community that's more respectful to vulnerable people. Thank you. Ms. Mariah, would you do us a favor and send that research to Mr. Rendon, please? To Mr. Rendon? Please. We'll be happy to. That way Thank we can you. look at it first. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? There are no further public comments. Thank you. All right. Awards and recognition. Uh, a, our uh, TTA Rodeo second place winner in 40 foot buses, Oscar Samora. And we have uh, the Rodeo third place winner, 35 foot buses, Manuel Martinez. All right. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to bring morning, Oscar and Manuel up here, and also one of our fine instructors at Victoria here. 
So Oscar here is a, is a native uh, of Robstown and has been there his, his entire life. He's been with the RTA 29 years now and has been our uh, local rodeo champion many times and participated in many state and national rodeos there. Man, and on the opposite end, we have Manuel here who has been here <coughs> just over a year and a half and, and managed to finish second place at TTA. And it, he's already stated his goal is to be number one uh, next year, right? <laughs> yeah. He's moving up the ranks quick. At, and then we have Victoria here because our instructors are, you know, help with the practice and have guided them through their, their career. And Victoria has been with us for, for 10 years now, so I want to give her a chance to get some recognition as part of this a, as well. So I will say for, for Oscar, he participated in the 40-foot bus challenge, and uh, he normally drives a 35-foot bus every day, and he's always participated in the 35-foot um, bus. So he did it different this year as a challenge, and he, he did quite well. And I tell the story to many, I was standing next to Jeff Arndt, the CEO of VIA, and his driver had just gone through and done really great, finished just inches from the last cone, and he was giving me a hard time. Then Oscar comes through and just nails it, and he, Je 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 Jeff just goes, oh, <laughs> and walked off. So uh, yeah, it was, it was a, a great event. I want to say a big thank you to, to all of them for their uh, you know, doing well and servicing our community. How would you like to do this? Uh, uh, do you want to take pictures and all that? And after the other awards, you want to do Okay, sounds good. All right, thank you, Derek. Thank you, guys. Congratulations. We'll be down there in just one second. And then we have a uh, 6C and D, uh, the APTA Certificate of Merit, bus security, uh, <coughs> excuse me, bus security awarded to the CCRTA and the APTA Certificate of Merit for the Emergency Management uh, Award. So for the uh, bus security, we have uh, in the past increased uh, uh, with security guards and police officers at all transfer station uh, from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, with the security guards. And then we have the officers that uh, come in in the evening, either 4 or 3 o'clock, all the way to 8 or 9 uh, p.m. Uh, what we have concentrated in the last year uh, was to do also bus rides in the uh, Robstown area all the way to Corpus and then within the corpus. We have three officers that do dedicate bus rides every day from Robstown to corpus, and then we have three officers, uh, some CCPD, some uh, ISD, some constables, that ride our, our um, major routes, either across the bridge um, to, the, uh, to the mall in the Molina area, all throughout the uh, system. And so we focus that uh, on bus safety for our customers. Uh, also, we also have the canine unit that we upped. We used to have it one or twice a month. Now we're having it uh, three times a month. So our customers see that there is a, a big present in law enforcement. Uh, it works here. And uh, so that's our, our, our main goal also. I know the board of directors is the bus safety for our customers. And on the emergency management, this is the first time the APTA has, has, has awarded this uh, throughout the nation. So we, we were blessed uh, to get this award. And we, we submitted uh, through the help of uh, marketing. Uh, Jeremy helped me a lot in, in submitting this uh, application. So it referenced the, the unity that, that the city, the county, and CCRTA um, have during the emergency. Uh, I think we're due next month to do a, a exercise. Uh, and it starts with the planning, it starts with good relationships. And so we, we submitted our, our plan and we were, we were awarded with, the, uh, with this uh, merit uh, certificate, Chairman. Thank you very much. How would you like us to proceed? Yeah, now we can go down there, all of us, and then have with the bus stop. <coughs>
guys still in here? Mr. Chairman, one other thing that when we were in uh, Minneapolis uh, a couple of weeks ago and we were awarded this, this certificate, uh, Michael Lesma with uh, Director of Transportation and um, Mario from uh, Maintenance, I let them know that this, this award was not just for safety and security. It begins with a good, safe bus, make sure that the brakes are working, the lights are working, we have good trainers. So it's a whole team effort. It's not just the safety security department. It, it goes in the operations, um, and everything that, w that they do uh, contributes to our certificate. So I, I told them in, in uh, Minneapolis, thank you for doing that for us. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Marisa, also, could you have the record show that uh, Director Canales and Director Wilbright are here, please? Thank you. <clears throat> And again, congratulations, everybody. Agenda item seven, discussion on possible action to approve board minutes of the board of directors meeting of April 5th, 2023. Do I have a motion? Uh, so moved. Have a motion. Second. All right. Did you catch that, Marisa? Any discussion, changes, additions, deletions? Hear none, all in favor, please state by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. <clears throat> We're on agenda item eight. Uh, these are consent items. The director can quote off uh, any one of these consent items if they so choose to discuss individually. Um, the routine and administrative in nature, and we got uh, 8A action to adopt the revised 2023 emergency preparedness policy, uh, B, action to approve the 2023 budget amen, amendment for pension, costs of $523,430. Action to issue a professional services agreement for battery electric bus deployment project with the Center of Transportation and Environment. D, action to exercise option year one on individual contracts to multiple vendors for bus parts supply. <coughs> Excuse me. And 8E, action to award a contract to H&E Equipment Services, Inc. for the purchase of an articulating boom lift. Does anybody want to pull any items off the consent agenda? Hearing none, I'll entertain the motion. So moved. I'll second. I have a motion by Director Wilbright and a second by uh, Director Canales. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please state by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Agenda item nine, discussion and possible action to reappointment of Robert Box to CCRTA's Committee on Accessible Transportation, RCAT. There you are. How you doing, Ms. Montes? I'm great. How about y'all? I hope y'all are doing well. Uh, Sharon Montes, Managing Director of Capital Programs and Customer Services. Um, this is a regular and routine item. We are <coughs> confirming the reappointment of Mr. Robert Box 
to our Committee on Accessible Transportation. Just some background on the process. Each RCAP member is originally appointed for a two-year term, except the chairperson who serves at the pleasure of the board. Members may be appointed uh, for up to four consecutive two-year terms. Uh, once a committee member reaches that term limit, they sit out for one year, and if they're interested in coming back, they can reapply. At this time, though, the RCAP committee member, Mr. Robert Box, is interested in continuing service and is seeking an additional two-year term. This is his second two-year term. But in order to continue with the service, the RTA, RTA Board of Directors must reappoint the members. Therefore, uh, the RCAT committee recommends the Board of Directors take action to reappoint Mr. Robert Box to CCRTA's Committee on Accessible Transportation. That concludes my presentation, sir. Thank you, ma'am. I'll entertain a motion. So moved. I have a motion by Dr. Sosa. Uh, so. Do I have a second? Second. <clears throat> Ms. Chadwell, uh, any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please state by saying aye. 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 Thank Those you, sir. Aye? Thank you, ma'am. Motion carries. <clears throat> Agenda item 10, committee chair reports. We'll start with admin and finance. Ms. Canales. Uh, good morning. Uh, we had our uh, monthly meeting uh, recently. Uh, everything went well, so there's really nothing new to report at this time other than uh, thank everybody on my committee for uh, doing such an amazing amazing job, and thank you to staff also for doing such an amazing job. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, 10B, Operations Capital Projects. Director Salazar. Uh, looking forward to the uh, possible value engineering changes, which is coming up. Uh, nothing else to report. Thank you, sir. Uh, 10C, uh, Madam Secretary. Uh, thank you. The, there is a lunch scheduled for the small city mayors. Um, if you all on the committee will please reach out and extend that invitation personally. Unfortunately, I cannot be there next week or on May the 11th. I'm traveling for work. But uh, looking Can you give forward us the, to the date and time, location. 11:30 on May the 11th here at the Sable Street Center at the I believe it's in Family Conference Hall. Thank you, ma'am. All right, legislative, Director Munoz. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, we'll be getting an update uh, here shortly from our consultant at Longbow. And uh, once we get our update, I'll send out an email to the other directors that are not present so that they can be updated on everything that's going on with uh, our legislative initiatives. Do you mind if I throw by your good news? Yeah, of course. Yes, of course. <laughs> he got engaged. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Now the, all of the internet knows, which is great. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Len. I appreciate it. Congratulations. All right, agenda item 11, update on the healthcare consulting risk management services with Roland Badetta Insurance. Good morning. Good morning. Wow, man. Um, um, Mr. Chair, I mean, Mr. Chief Executive, uh, I, Mike and I, obviously, I, every time it's, uh, uh, obviously, you know, me, him, John, and uh, every time, occasionally, uh, Eddie, and it's just a big joke. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> um, Mr. Chief Executive, would you like to make some comments before I start? Or? Okay, okay, I'm good. Well, anyway, um, obviously. I, I take that back. Um, okay, yes, sir, yes, sir. <laughs> so. Uh, uh, was it a couple of months ago you came and yeah. briefed the uh, Board of Directors, reference our insurance, and the beautiful work that you're doing for us, <laughs> for the, our employees. But uh, so there was some uh, issues referenced when they ch changed over the insurance. Um, uh, you know, our employees were having some questions, and so I got a hold of Ro Roland and his uh, counterparts and asked him, uh, I need you guys to come and, and uh, visit with our employees to make sure that you know they feel comfortable with the with the change, and I think it went well. HR did a, a, a great job getting uh, three or four different meetings in, in the morning, evening, and uh, I think it also on the weekends with uh, operators and mechanics. So, uh, explain what All right. transpired. Thank you. Well, um, obviously, you know issues, actions, and remedies for the health plan administration. As as I've said to you before. Uh, we've got a very unique plan in the sense that uh, each, each component is basically designed. It's not, it's not a Blue Cross plan. It's not a Humana plan. 
It's not, uh, it's not a one size fits all. It's, there's, there's customization, uh, there's, uh, uh, instead of having a copay, which occasionally, it's in, in the past, has been frustrating for physicians because they're used to the whole world paying a copay. Each employee has $1,000 of benefit up front, okay? And, and what it is is that, so the first $1,000 is no charge. The first $1,000 of care is an example of that. So what it is is, number one, it encourages primary care utilization for individuals to utilize that, and there should be no, nothing to prohibit them from doing that because it's zero cost. The other thing that it does is it creates a level of consumerism because the first thing people ask is, well, what happens when I run out of my $1,000? So we, we, we did some increases in benefits, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, the other thing that we have is that we've got a special arrangement with the doctor's center so that way, at any time, let's say, for example, somebody utilizes all the rest of their, their $1,000, they can still go to the doctor center's facilities, and for up to $300, there's no charge. Okay, now I don't recommend, well, one of the th challenges that we've had with that is people will use that as their primary care physician, but I don't recommend you do that. You just use that so, you know, um, you've, you've, you've got a cold or something, and you, you want to go over there very quickly, or, uh, you know, you hurt your knee or something. You know, we just want to be able to, try and create that upfront coverage because we know we're le leading with, you know, individuals that, uh, what is it, that uh, they're more blue collar, so we wanna have them the access to care. So, and, and along that lines, you know, there's something that I remember going to a TML conference um, is that they basically said, and I've said it to you before, that on occasion you're gonna have to embrace disruption because if you wanna have a cookie cutter type of deal, you're gonna pay for a cookie cutter type of deal. And there's a cost associated with that. So we look at this, we customize it towards the community, we customize it. So with that being said, we, we had some challenges and um, there, there was a change made to the health plan. We didn't change the insurance, okay? There was, then there were some very positive changes. What basically happened was uh, uh, there was a, a change in the network. We, for the longest time, we had had a, um, a, a contract directly with Spawn. So what is it? And with that, we were able to capitalize on very, very uh, uh, attractive service fees, all right? And by the way, I forgot to, uh, if I, uh, I, I made a mistake by not announcing Rick Medrano. Rick Medrano works for 90 Degrees, used to be Entrust. Uh, and, and some of you have heard this before, the joke never gets old that uh, Rick, when I, we used to work together, and Rick's, I was in sales and Rick's was in operations, so Rick had to deliver on all the promises I made. <laughs> so Rick is actually only 30 years old. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so he had that difficult job, but you know, Rick is, is, is he's, he's a problem solver. If you, we have an issue, we call him, he gets to take care of, what is it, and so he's, he's just a great guy to, to, to have out there. So. The, the actual change in the health plan is that we changed networks. And the reason that that was basically happening is that uh, uh, Spawn is part of actually Christus and they've done so for a long time. And they've operated somewhat independently here because of the uniqueness of the design. And so uh, Christus had acquired Spawn, but they allowed us to still have that specific plan. Well, Christus decided, well, okay, we're not gonna do that anymore. Which we thought was very positive news because now we have access to better rates in San Antonio, um, what have you, Irv in, da in the Dallas area. So there's, as you've be well heard, there's a shortage of primary care physicians and, and uh, um, 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 specialists here in town. So people go to San Antonio, they'll go to other areas for specialized work. So we thought it was a great thing that it was happening. And um, the, the network that we have now is healthcare highways. There was an arrangement being made with uh, healthcare highways to direct, work directly with Spawn, and they were gonna expand on that network. And so uh, um, we, and, and you know, it's, it's my fault, and it's, it's 90 degrees fault, is that it's typically because we're constantly feel like we're sharpening that, sh that saw, and as it turns out, the Spawn doctors are in the network, but the contract wasn't really, uh, wasn't uh, ever fulfilled between Spawn and uh, directly with healthcare highways. So in other words, you may be part of the Spawn network, what have you, as far as a physician, but uh, what is it, uh, you may be part of the Spawn network as a physician, but you can also be contracted with healthcare highways. 
So there, we, we, we believe that there wasn't going to be a ton of disruption. It's just that there were several doctor's offices. And, and then to doctor's testaments, they're dealing, with, they're dealing with all the carriers. And nowadays, they're dealing with multiple carriers. Uh, what is it? Multiple networks. And somebody comes in, and they've got a, uh, an ID card that says healthcare highways. Most of the time, it's like, well, I've never seen this. But the doctor could still be contracted with them. So that's part of the challenge that we had is that those changes basically were also cha challenges for the doctor's offices. So the, there was a problem that people said, well, they're not accepting my ID card. Well, once again, you know, what, what basically is kind of, a lot of things that have happened is that, um, you know, the pandemic has got us complacent and we were doing things more so. We weren't doing things on hand. I mean, uh, directly in front, there was no that face-to-face. -face. Everything was done electronically. Uh, for the last two years, three years, uh, the enrollment is done completely electronically. So there's not where back in the old days, you know, as many of you might have remembered, we, we came in and Rick would be here and to talk to each employee one-on-one, -on -one, we'd re, re, redo the, uh, the benefits if it was a passive enrollment of which we call it. There was no changes. So there was somebody to sit one-on-one -on -one where we could talk to. Well, obviously the pandemic happened and we had to look at other wa ways. So we kind of got complacent in the sense that we weren't having that one-on-one -on -one contact. So uh, the other thing is that we provide two communication systems uh, to be able to get information out to the employees. One is of which is directly from the enrollment platform. Uh, another of which is a little bit more user friendly of which we send out information about health and welfare, about uh, wellness, about all those type of, of, of issues with regard, things that are going on in legislation, how to use your health plan if you have a specific type of it. And so uh, some employees say, you know what, I don't want this mess. And you can opt out as if it's spam. And so what was happened is when we sent out the information with regard to the network, I, I, we, we really believe a lot of these individuals, we sent it out through that medium because, uh, anyway, I won't go into the details, but we sent it out to that medium. And there were a lot of people that just didn't know because they thought they see Roland Barrera, it comes from Roland Barrera. And they automatically assume, okay, it's not anything I want to see. And now in this day and age that we've been able to, that, that people aren't just not paying attention to their email. And so some people opted out because it's just, it's spam. So we weren't getting all that information to all the employees. We had once again, we'd, we'd gotten a little complacent as far as doing everything electronically instead of getting in front of the employees. So, um, you know, so the communication rollout was a little bit, wasn't what basically how we should have done it. So now we're going to use the enrollment platform specifically. It doesn't have the same bell and whistles. It's not, HTML, it's not in an HTML format. But the thing is, is that uh, it shows that it'll be coming for either Angelina, Joanna, or Mike from that situation. So that way the employees know. Uh, another thing, a piece of technology that our, my office has purchased is a tech system. Uh, we're still working out the kinks in it, but eventually, uh, what is it? And I believe I believe the city staff, uh, I mean the city, the RTA staff also has that type of system. So that way, if we're going through an enrollment, because people now pay more attention to texts. So that's something that we're considering. We're not doing that yet. And then the network issues that, you know, my doctor doesn't accept this. Well, it's once again, I go back to, as I said, when you have these uh, doctors have to deal with all these schedules, all these carriers, all these networks, they get in and they say, well, you know what? My doctor doesn't accept this program. And then they had the old ID cards. Well, there, there's no such spawn network anymore. So that handling that disruption was a challenge for all the employees, including some of your executive leadership team. So, uh, but in, you know, what was happening and then what we started doing in January is we were dealing with those issues one-on-one. -on -one. You know, I'd call Rick and I'd say, hey dude, what, you know, uh, WTF, what, what, what's going on here? And what the, how the thing was. But then, you know, uh, and, and Rick was very responsive. They would get on, find out what he, every issue was very specifically. Um, however, you know, Mike came about and says, hey man, this is getting really bad. And we had obviously an organized group that came up that, that had some complaints. So we, we put all that together and we strategized all of us in a meeting and said, okay, how are, we gonna, how are we gonna basically come up with the remedies? And so here I've got some bullet points. So the first thing we did is we had some employee meetings uh, you know, this, those are the dates, and I, I want to say there were two of them at 5 a.m. For, for, to be there for pullout. Now, if any of you know my son Richard, getting him out here at 5 a.m. <laughs> shows his commitment level. 
I think maybe uh, one day he didn't, just didn't go to sleep because he's not, he's not one of those that gets up early in the morning. I'm joking. <laughs> uh, what is it? And Rick lives in Rockport. So Rick was out here at 5 a.m. on the two occasions. So he, uh, I told him, why don't you just spend the night, you know? And, uh, but anyway, so that just shows the level of communication. We had uh, two individuals from my staff here. Rick was here. Did you have anybody else here other than your staff? Okay, so they had individuals from Medical Helpline. So there was a, uh, there, we, we had those meetings, we visited, I believe uh, it was 80 to 90 people, Angelina? 88 people, so we had 88 individuals, had specific questions. Uh, we had giveaways, so that way we can entice people to come in. Uh, what is it? Uh, um, we just had little, you know, gift bags of stuff that we had. We got uh, your, the wellness carrier to give us some stuff, and so that way the employees had a reason to come see us, whether they had an issue or not. Um, you know, uh, we did some things, you know, like I said, we talked about healthcare highways, you know, they have a web portal of how they can look up providers, uh, the ID cards. Uh, once again, many members were still using their old ID cards. And, um, and, and like I said, what, what, what happened in, in, uh, in, in, you know, this experiment, I say all feedback is good because what, what we found is that that utilization of that old system, uh, basically when people opt out, then, which we're required to do, then all of a sudden now it, it makes it more difficult because people didn't know, individuals didn't know that they had to get a new card. And then the other thing is, is that, in fact, I was just recently at a conference and we were discussing the bugs of even the enrollment platform, is that sometimes address changes are made and we're not notified. It, the way they, we, they call it, it was a very specific thing. So we might not have had the right address for those employees because it's all based on the system not based on, um, you know, so, so that was a thing. So we found out that there were some things there. Uh, specific claims questions addressed with multiple members so that way if somebody said, hey, is this covered, is it not? How does it work on occasions? Like I said, the issue with the doctor center, sometimes people don't know any better and they paid and we'll say, no, we can get you that money refund. Uh, when I, once again, I talked about the $1,000. It used to be where it was $1,000 per individual, but family had $2,000 max. So if somebody had two children and the spouse, well, then they were limited to 2,000. Well, one of the benefits, improvements that we made as a result of, as I go back into a lot of this uh, ways that we control cost, we're able to increase the benefit to the employees. So now it's $1,000 per person with no maximum. So in other words, if, I'm a, if I've got you know, two children and I work here and I have my spouse on the plan, well, then I've got up to $4,000 of benefit, $1,000 at all. So we looked at that. Uh, from uh, um, uh, what is an actuarial standpoint and said that it's going to have minimal impact, but yet the benefit to the employees is that much more. Um, the doctor's center, once again, no charge up to $300. You know, with all the turnover a lot of times, you know, everybody gets all kinds, of, they get information overload. They get all these booklets or all this stuff and you look through it and people just don't look through it. So uh, as a result of one of those one-on-ones, we told these individuals what the, the new benefit. Uh, uh, as a part of when Mike obviously uh, uh, fell into this role, he had, he had expressed to us the challenges with the dental because it was limited to just $1,000 in benefit. Well, once again, we looked at that during the budget process and we informed the employees that now you've got $2,000 of benefit with a dental. Um, so uh, that was another impact that we had that it, it wasn't communicated to the employees that, hey, we're improving your benefits. Um, we discussed the web portal and then there's an app to be able to get your ID card. Uh, in fact, yeah, there's an app. And so that's something, once again, that it's not communicated out to the employees because of the system with which we, we communicate it out. Um, we explained the changes and the benefits, as I talked about. Uh, we provided, you know, benefit guides. Uh, we had, they had uh, uh, 90 degrees came up with a one pager of frequently asked questions. Uh, we explained the process of healthcare highways because, you know, everybody looks at it as like insurance. And I'm going to tie that up in a, in a in a, in, a, in a little bow here in a little bit. Um, they, we said how, how to find providers, uh, how to find pr primary care physicians, uh, you know, to, if, if you're dealing with existing or new patients, specialists, uh, explaining, navigating the website for future use, explain the difference between the 90 degrees uh, benefits website versus healthcare highway site, because healthcare, high, I mean, healthcare highways is the network and um, um, what have you, um, um, 90 degrees is the administrator. So they're the ones that pay all the claims. So once again, it's an area of, it's a little bit of inconvenience. If, if we had like a blue cross, obviously it would be on one web website, but there's a cost associated with that. 
Uh, we provided enrollment follow-up for new hires and uh, qualified life events. Um, and let me see how many of these. Uh, we, es we escalated some claims assistance so that way we know who, who they need to call if they've got issues. Uh, enrollment assistance. Uh, we explained that any discrepancies they have on their uh, explanation of benefits, um, what is it, assisted with regular email updates, you know, that's something that we do on a regular basis. And I, I think I put this slide deal in twice. Somebody helped me prepare this. And so, uh, uh, and then we also helped out with the login for Go365, which is a wellness program, which once again, it's another different component. It's a Humana program. Uh, we talked about the disability and life benefits, how to access that. So we just wanted to make ourselves available. I'm gonna run through here. Um, let me see, did I go the wrong way? Okay. So one of the things, I, I, you know, nowadays, um, um, people look at it from a standpoint of insurance with regard to medical. We look at it that way because of the, we, the way we purchase property and casualty insurance, and if we have a large claim, you want it paid. But now the way healthcare works is you're actually just paying for access to healthcare. It's not necessarily insurance because you say, I want to be able to go see my doctor. I want to be able to have access to these prescriptions. I want to be able to have access to this hospital. So it's, it's to the point now, okay, the more benefits you have and the more convenience you have, there's a cost associated with it. So what we've done is that we work directly with the, the, the pharmacy benefit manager, we work directly with the network, we work directly with the uh, administrator to pay the claims, uh, they do work directly with the stop loss carrier, and so it's all a component to try and, and, and candidly keep you in a very rich benefits that you have for your employees here. They're, the benefits are richer than the city of Corpus Christi, they're richer than the county, they're richer than uh, the school district. Uh, the only one that has a richer plan than you in the public sector is the Port of Corpus Christi. So who also, they administered for how many years, Rick? 20 years. For 20 years, and that, so that system works as far as to, uh, uh, that system works to be able to have rich benefits because then you have that situation where as many as employers know that if you have a challenge with your health plans, particularly as a small employer, or even if you, if you have 100 employees, sometimes what is the action that happens? The rates go up and what do we do? We just raise the deductible and we raise the co-pays. That's the action that has been done. And here, what we've done is that we've customized everything and then with that, we, we, that's where that all came in. We came to that customization and we weren't communicating to the employees. So with that, I stand by for any questions. Any questions for Mr. Barrera? Yes. Director Wilbright. Yeah, uh, the doctor center thing is really interesting. What's that relationship? Um, well, um, about, oh man, in 1999, uh, what is it, they were, uh, you know, and. Uh, and it, it was, I, that's when I first got on the board. And I, I don't want to sound like I take credit for it. I was part of the team. I was on the board and obviously in the business and uh, 90 Degrees, which was interest at the time, uh, uh, the owner's son, uh, director of marketing, his name's David Jacobson. Uh, David was very creative. And at the time, uh, the doctor center, Keith Rose, had the occupational medical uh, service. So he, David said, well, why don't we just go ask? You guys got a big business with him. And, get some leverage from him, and uh, see if he'll write a direct contract with you. And it's just been plugging along like that for 24 years. So basically their incentive is just if there's more than $300 of work, they get it. No, uh, no, no. And, well, no, they typically, they've got a contracted deal. It's, it's $300. We pay for the service. What do we pay? Um, whatever the contracted rate is that we have with him. It just looks like any other copay. It's like when you go see a doctor, and let's say your copay's Thirty dollars okay. or fifty dollars. The actual cost might be a hundred. So, so it's not three hundred dollars free. It's just three hundred dollars free to the employee. Exactly. Exactly. So we're paying the three hundred dollars. Exactly. Whatever the cost may be, it may be a hundred. It may be seventy-five. It may be and as long as the cost associated with the service is less than three hundred dollars. It's no cost to the employee. And if it's over three hundred, we pay the first three hundred. Exactly. Very good. Very good. Very good way to explain it. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Good question. Any other questions? I agree. I just have a comment, Councilman. I really appreciate, and Angelina and Rick, how much interface you're doing with our staff. Um, you know, we have <coughs> some grumblings with a union proposal, and just really means a lot that they are having more of a personal 
interface and impact, and um, if you all will just keep that up. Um, the feedback is good. It's good for your growth. It's good for us to know what what's working and what's not working. So just thanks for that. And, and you know what? I tell you what, I, I, I really do appreciate your business specifically for that reason. I, I, you know, we have a saying in, in our office that all feedback is good, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, what have you. So we get that feedback, and candidly what it does is it helps us all of a sudden. We in my office, so I appreciate the fact, evaluated our entire systems because we were operating based on how we operate with you guys. And sometimes when we're going off to other, other, our other vendors, we use your, your system here as a testimonial to how it could work. I, I tell you what, I'll, 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 I'll go down a small rabbit trail. I'm so frustrated at the city of Corpus Christi because they're not open-minded to doing a program like this. And they have a consultant that came out of, uh, that comes out of Austin, and he just wants that cookie cutter thing, and the staff just doesn't know any better, and so they, it, they're just fine with it. And here, once again, I said that we have the richest benefits, one of some of the richest benefits in the entire community. Uh, you well know as a business owner, you've had to make those tough decisions. Um, what is it, at, and you know, as to what the cost is, and you know, here, uh, we've, we've really customized it so that we have that. Anyway, but thank you so much. Any other questions? I have a few questions. Yes, ma'am, please. Director well, Manning. Thank you for um, giving us some detail on some enhancements that you all are doing. I know personally that health insurance is extremely complicated and is getting out of, out of control. Yeah. Um, so I'm happy to hear that we're working towards trying to simplify things and communicate with the uh, staff and the employees. Um, so if I heard you correctly, please correct me. Yes, if, yes. If, um, so I have a few questions. The thousand dollars that is um, given to each employee, is that like credit or is that, um, how, how is that given to them? Do they use that just for their co-pays or they can use that anything health related? Uh, it's, 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 it's for basically any primary care. Any primary care. So, uh, what is it? It doesn't work. It, it doesn't have the flexibility of, like, say, for example, a health savings account. Mm -hmm. uh, what is it? Candidly, we came up with it before health reimbursement accounts uh, became very popular. And so, uh, what is it? We've just it's it works very similar to health reimbursement account, but it's specifically for primary care. So they get a card and it has a thousand dollars, or it's just in their account. No, 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 no. The way it works basically is that when it's adjudicated. When it's adjudicated, the third-party administrator, they actually customized the software for us many years ago. Uh, so that way it could be done like that. Because the challenges that you have sometimes if somebody has a, a copay and they're using a health reimbursement account is, uh, once again, uh, we just basically tell them. Now, we have encountered some challenges because when they get close to the $1,000, it depends on who bills us. And so uh, um, what have you. But, you know, th th that challenge is it's, it's, it's just never going to go away. So it's not, it doesn't work like an, a, a health reimbursement account. They don't get a separate card. We wanted to do that because at the time we just didn't want, we wanted to be there less confusion. And do they have access, each employee, to see like what their balance is or, I mean, is there somewhere for them to go to keep track of that? Unfortunately, what has, what has to happen is that they have to call, correct me if I'm wrong, Rick, they have to call in right now. So what they'll do is that they get their explanation of benefits and then it explains it. And so that way they'll call in to the third party administrator who pays all the claims, and they'll let them know that, they'll ask them, okay, this is where we're at. Rick, go ahead and come up yeah, here so that we can do it. Rick, come, come up here so that I need you to talk into the microphone. Yeah, so the, we're, <laughs> we're being right. recorded. So. The, the 90 degree benefit website will also, it's, it, um, it has all the claim history on each individual. So anytime we process a claim, you know, there's an explanation of benefits, but the electronic version of that explanation of benefit is loaded on the individual website. So they can see their claims and they can see how much we've processed. So um, to answer that question is like, if we get a bill for $100 um, for an office visit, we're gonna process a $100 payment to that provider. Now they're gonna have 900 left. So our system tracks that. So it's not a, like, as Roland said, not an individual card, uh, debit card or anything like that. So, but it, it's, it's primary care, it's specialist, it's right. chiropractor, Urgent care, diagnostic uh, lab, and patho uh, and radiology. Those are the items that go towards that $1,000 uh, benefit allowance. And so are the $300 that are for that specific 
doctors, uh, is that tied to that thousand or is that separate? It's no, separate. That's, a, that's a safety net, that's a freebie. So anytime they go to the doctor center or Cal Allen Minor Emergency Clinic, whatever the cost is associated with that visit does not erode that thousand dollars. It doesn't touch it at all. They can go all year long to the doctor center and never use a dollar of that thousand dollar allowance. Good question. Good question. Don't go too far. <laughs> <laughs> I said I had a few. <laughs> it's just he's very, he, he, he understands it very specifically. You need your ops so. guy. Yeah. <laughs> um, for the ID cards that the employees get, so from what I understood is that one of the frustrations from the employees is that they feel that they call the doctor at spawn and the doctor's in the network, but the hospital wasn't in the network. Did I understand that correctly? No, no, no. The, it, it's they're, they're still in the network. It's okay. just like it's just like any carrier. I, I mean, any facility. Uh, they're going to take Blue Cross. They're going to take Humana. They're going. You might have a doctor on occasion. I mean, we've encountered it. And we because we deal direct. We dealt directly with the network. We didn't have always have that type of disruption, because you've heard horror stories of, hey, uh, I went and had this surgery and the uh, the uh, what is it uh, the, the anesthesiologist was not in the network. You know, uh, what is it? Or the rate they sent me, I mean, the same, we had this over at, at Spawn in Beeville that they had, uh, Spawn had rented out to a radiologist inside the facility, but was not in the Spawn network. So, what have you, the doctors out of convenience, hey, just go over there and get your test done. And uh, what is it? And they were referring them, and they were inside the Spawn facility. I remember Rick helped us out with that back then. It wasn't, this, I'm just saying this was in Beeville. And that was really frustrating the employees. So then once again, we had to contract with them directly. So we've been able to really work through that. So that way that, yeah, so that I, I just, I'm probably over explaining the question, but yeah, the, the facilities and the doctors are in the, in the network. And Rick, can you just attest about to the amount of disruption? There's, there's okay. really, no, there's really, it's, it's just expanded. There's no doctors that have gone away. Yeah, I mean, there's, uh, there, there's a few of, of the physicians that were in the spawn network that did not um, get into the healthcare highways network. It's in the, about a, uh, there's about 95% of the providers that were in spawn are in healthcare highways. But on the flip side, there are providers that are in healthcare highways that weren't in spawn. So they're gaining new providers and they've lost maybe 5% of the physicians. And those that are lost, we've reached out to healthcare highways to, to reach out to these, that 5% to credential them, get them into their network. And we also find out in talking to the employees during those, those three days worth of meetings that a lot of times they said, well, my doctor is not in the network. Right there in the spot, we called healthcare highways and we got on the internet and they said, I said, well, they're showing up on their website. So it just, it's education with the provider staff as well because you have that front office staff where there may be some turnover and they don't know that they're in the healthcare highways network when in reality they, they are. Yeah, so that was leading perfectly into my next question. What are you doing to, you know, like you're coming in here and educating the employees about what they can do. Is there any activity done with the doctor's offices to educate them as absolutely. far as? Ab absolutely, I mean, we've, we've and once again, in the customization of the plan that we have, we've, the, that's always evolving. That's always evolving. I mean, it's, and, it, and you know, and that's the whole thing about dealing with people with local, which I know many of you believe in. Uh, what is it? They've got quite an investment here locally. Uh, we're dealing with Spawn, you know, knowing them, knowing the CEO, you know, uh, what is it? Dom Dominguez is originally from Rockport, spends a lot of time here. So, you know, we can talk to those individuals and say, hey, we need your help getting this doc on there. And that's, whereas if we, if we had this problem with uh, a Humana or a Blue Cross or Aetna, we're gonna call into the oblivion of wherever their network is and wherever their office is in Illinois and just cross our fingers and hope the doctor gets in there. So, uh, whereas here, uh, what is it? We, we, can, we can deal with people one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah, so is there anything strategically that you're doing to educate the employees of the, the physicians there at like maybe doing a luncheon at the hospital or something. Is there anything that? Oh, with regard to notifying the physicians? Yeah, well, their staff, because it's, you know, you call your doctor and I want to schedule an appointment. What insurance, the first thing they care about is what insurance do you have? Yeah, yeah. And then they hear um, highway. Yeah, health highway. Highways. Um, and they're like, I don't know what that is. Well, we've had conversations with healthcare highways. I know they were working directly with the chief executive. Rick, go ahead and expand on yeah. that. I mean, at this point, when uh, healthcare highways is actually their job is to come down here. They they have their team from Dallas coming down in here and going to each individual physician that they have contracted with to educate them, to explain to them that you know that yes, this was formerly the Spawn Network and now we've expanded it to the Christus, which is called Healthcare Highways, and yes, you are part of it. You have a signed contract. 
So th that is what healthcare highways is doing. They're doing the reach out to the to their contracted physicians and providers in the, in the Corpus Christi area, okay, in the surrounding area, the nine county area. And actually, like uh, you, you mentioned earlier, it actually goes extends statewide. It's not just um, Respond was just a regional network in the nine county area. Uh, the healthcare highways is throughout Texas. Um, uh, as far as the ID cards, because there was like some confusion with the name change, is there any way to put on the ID cards like formerly Krista Spawn Network or anything to tie that to make it easier for the employees and the staff of the doctors? Um, that's a good question. I mean, they, uh, 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 90 degrees, I always want to say intro, 90 degrees basically customizes those cards and they work with a specific vendor. Uh, I, I guess that's something that we could take a look at. Yeah. So I think it'd just be easier and more so for when the employee calls. The employee only knows so much. It's already a complicated monster as it is. But, you know, when they call in and say, well, who's your insurance? And then they read it off and it can say formally, you know. Yeah, let's talk about that one-on-one. -on -one. There'd be require some troubleshooting. I'm thinking of some ways that it would be great. And I'll, it's in, in the back of my head. I'm thinking, oh, that might be a challenge here. Yeah. So maybe you and I can talk about it one-on-one. -on -one. Okay. And last question. Um, the website, so it sounds like there's multiple websites that the employees need to go to. How can we simplify that and make it, you know, because uh, there's ways to connect websites together, but I know in this case it could be a little bit complicated, but what can we do to give the employees one web address and then they can get all the information they need there? Um, uh, well, I'll tell you what, there's, we, we have looked at that. And, and the reason, but the here's here's a couple of challenges that we have. And, I, and when I was visiting at that conference here, uh, in fact, uh, um, one of the things that we talked about, he, I'll, I'll, and I'll go back to a funny story. We were one of the first in the community, uh, what is it, to adopt an enrollment platform. Correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, you're dealing with that. And uh, we wanted to have, you know, that availability. And the first thing from this company that they had their chief executive, so you're telling me another username and password, you know. And that's the frustration. And so I, I, I don't know. I guess we can talk about whatever system that you have here for, for employees. A lot of integration is what the, I went to this conference is about because everybody's bombarded with all these websites. And one of the things that this particular vendor, it's a program called Ease, is they were talking about that integration and having uh, links so that way individuals could connect to. And so go ahead, Rick. Well, I just wanted to mention that the 90 degree benefits web portal, uh, it's, a, it's a portal. I mean, from there, there are links. It says find a provider and you click on that button and it takes you to the Healthcare Highways website. So really the, the primary uh, website that they should be accessing is the 90degreebenefits.com website. Yeah. The same website that they can look at their claims online, they can order ID cards online, they can <laughs> download the phone app, is the same app that they can look for providers. So it's one, you know, one, one source. Well, the challenge is, is everything is based on when they enroll, you know, and then they kind of think yeah. that they'll forget that. So we're, right. we've, uh, we've also talked about, you know, having tutorials so that way they can click on a video and say, hey, this is about the 90 degrees website and this is where you go. So we're, we're continuing to try and sharpen this all, but it's a universal problem. Yeah, I, I think that would be a great idea to have because even for someone, like if I'm a bus driver, I'm focused on street lights and uh, roads and my map and my destination, you know, I'm not going to be as savvy. I, I'm not personally as savvy, you know, going through. And sometimes I go to these websites and it's like, oh, everything's there, but you can't find anything. And yeah, it's yeah. just not simplified. But I think having a course, just like you all did to explain the benefits, but explaining how you can access the information, it, you know, and if those classes are available, well, then there's really no excuse on that I don't know where to go. Well, I, I think once again, we're, 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 the staff is, the, your team here is committed for us to um, visit on a regular basis during your employee meetings and do those things. That's the thing that was missing. You know, people are so inundated, inundated with, with emails and now with texts. I don't know how many times, you know, uh, you, get, you get spam texts now on a regular basis. So uh, the best way that we can communicate with them is one-on-one -on -one and we have these meetings. And once again, we were doing that prior to the pandemic and we became complacent because we had to operate just to be able to get information out. And, and sometimes we get complacent because it's, it's easier just to send out the information than it is to get everybody one-on-one. -on -one. And so I, I'm, I, we're, 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 we're re-engaging that. I, we've learned our lesson. Yes. 
Well, thank you. Those were all my questions. I do appreciate all the efforts that you all have put into trying to communicate better and improve the systems and, and the ways of doing things. I understand that insurance is complicated, and whenever there's changes, it becomes more complicated, and just when you've figured it out, it changes again. So um, thank you so much for your efforts. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, not so much a question as uh, it was great seeing you the other day at uh, the conference that was in town. Oh, yeah. I know it meant a lot to me personally as well as the members on the board, the different events you went to. Uh, obviously, uh, you were on this board at one time, so we know transportation is important to you, uh, but it's also important to our city. So having you there was, was huge, at least I thought so. Thank so you. I really I appreciate, appreciate you that. being there. And also, uh, on a second note, thank you for the update. Uh, I know, uh, you know, a good health insurance uh, goes with employee retention and, and having these benefits and, and the ability for uh, our employees to understand the benefits is, is instrumental in, in keeping employees and doing the jobs that we do. So thank you. Yes. And, you know, if, and I may add, and I, I, that's the thing, you know, up to the, the, the testament of your team is that it's like I said, we've had situations where we had in the, in the old days when we were back in doing all the enrollment meetings uh, before we had technology. I mean, we would have people say that, you know what, I worked at CCISD and now I'm here in maintenance and I actually got a raise, a huge raise in pay because now it only cost me $250 a month to put my family on there, you know, whereas you go anyplace else, I mean, it's, 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 it's an excess probably now, $1,500 to have for, and that's, that's even if it's being subsidized. So, you know, I, I think at the city it's $900 for family coverage. So that gives you an example of, and, and that's where all the customization comes into to be able to afford that. And there's a, obviously the generosity of it. So um, what is it, that, that's, that's, thank you so much. That, that, it, I'm, we appreciate that it goes uh, noticed. It, it doesn't go unnoticed. Yes, sir. You addressed this earlier, I'm just curious. Would it be possible to add an HSA component or is that just not feasible at all? Um, well, we would have to, we would offer an, uh, uh, a, uh, uh, we'd have to offer an alternate plan because the, the, the health savings account program, it, it has to be encompassed with a high deductible health plan. Now, I personally have one of those uh, because I look at it from the standpoint of the ability to be able to have an additional tax deduction and to be able to utilize those dollars tax free. Um, what have you, in a more blue collar environment, what is it we want to ensure that they have that availability. I mean, we had uh, at one time a dual option, but there wasn't a lot of participation in the other program. Uh, it could be something that we could revisit. Typically, it's executives that want to do that because the appeal for everyone is the tax deduction more so than the, the access to the, to the benefits. Sure. I should not know if there to be a lower premium cost that would be associated with the high deductible plan. Well, what it is is that we look at it from an actuarial standpoint because, once again, you're self-funded. So you're actually paying the claims. So we look at if we had a situation like that where an individual wanted to have a high deductible health plan and they, they, they funded it for themselves either through, uh, through a savings account or something of that nature, the health savings account, then um, what have you, we're still going to pay the claims. So it's not necessarily, it's something that we look at actuarially. So uh, it's something we can explore. We hadn't done it in a long time simply because uh, uh, you know, once again, those those appeal to individuals that are looking more so for the tax deduction than they are so to have access to those benefits. So, uh, but I, and going back to the city, I had keep mentioning them. They do that plan exclusively for the police department, and it's it's uh, and we we've been looking at it actuarially to see what it costs. So I, I'm sure that we can look around the the communities with all the access that they have. Um, we won't just look at this. We'll look. When you at, say we're looking at it actuarially, what do you actually mean? Um, well, here's the thing. What we we go back and we say, um, what were what were actually the claims in these prior years? All right, and they have software and they have a customization, so that way we can go back and we could plug it in. If we change the plan design, all right, then basically the the computer will spit out that okay, this is what it would have the cost associated would have been. So, so the there's concept a of it is it's too expensive. It would be too expensive for us based on prior usage. No, 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 no. I'm not saying it wouldn't work. I'm just saying that sometimes uh, you it'd look at it. It would be more other... expensive. Huh? I'm just saying put it in plain English. It would be more expensive for us, the payer, to offer it than to not. Is that correct? For you, the payer. Um, well, we haven't determined that. That's my thing. We haven't determined that. 
Sometimes for, here's the thing that you look at, for the credit that you may have. Now, I'm not just speaking of this plan. I'm just saying uh, uh, all encompassing. For um, uh, what the industry has determined is that for the credit that they get, what is it, the disruption that an employee has to not have access to care, because if, let's say, for example, you have a bus driver and now they've got a $3,000 deductible and it's, and, and it's the way a, a, uh, a high deductible health plan works is there's no benefits prior to the deductible, sure. right? So if you have no benefits prior to the deductible and you're reluctant to utilize the plan simply because of that, then um, uh, what have you, then you may not get the access to care that you need. Then you may say, you know what, I don't want to spend this. I've only got maybe $500 in my high deductible health you plan. You may not choose to get the access. You don't have, it's not that you don't have access. You still have the same access because you'd be saving presumably $150 a month. I understand. Once again, well, that's the thing. That's the thing that we've determined. Because here's the thing, if individuals, if individuals, it's, it's, it's a personal decision for an individual to decide if they're gonna go see somebody. You've got a more complex system and they have to be more engaged because as a utilizer of, pub, uh, of a high deductible health plan, then uh, what is it, I have to go out and uh, explain to that, in, to sometimes do the same thing, explain to the doctor's office, and so I've gotta pay for the cash up front. We utilize that system. Now, uh, once again, to a, to a blue collar worker, a lot of times they want convenience. And so that's the thing that we're actually paying for. We can look at it, and just the same thing. Let's talk about it, you and I, one on one, so that way we can explore it. And, and I can tell you in the instances where I think it works uh, perfectly, and in other instances is where people, we would rather have that delta of we want people to have access because uh, right here, a third of our population is diabetic. And so that's something that we have to address. So that way, we want them to get that primary care very quickly. So, but we, yeah, let's chat about it. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Roland, thank you very much. Really appreciate you. Our pleasure. Our pleasure. We appreciate you guys. I know 90 Degrees uh, does as well. So does Rick. That so plan almost sounds like that Van Halen song, though. <laughs> Highway to where? <laughs> Healthcare. <laughs> ACDC. 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 Sorry. Yeah. Don't forget, I sing. If you want, I can yeah. do it. <laughs> It needs right, to be after 5 o'clock. All right, all right. Thank you, guys. All right. <clears throat> Agenda item 12, update on the value engineering process for uh, the new Port Air Station. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, um, Good morning again. We have Mr. Paul Robolka here from Janak Architects. He's going to go through the items and explain um, how we came up with the deductions. Um, Mr. Paul, if you'll take it away. Yes, good morning. Uh, first off, so what you see on the screen, this is these are uh, recommended value engineering options that we've come up with so far, but we're still working through the process to come up with some, some additional value engineering options. So right now, this, the $149,000 you see uh, as the bottom line there, that's, that's uh, what, we've, what we're looking to um, uh, uh, capture to date but we're still working on this. So uh, the options are, number one, reduce ornamental perimeter fence from eight foot to seven foot uh, for a deduction of $12,613. Uh, second item, delete concrete columns at pedestrian entry C gates. Uh, deduction of $26,000. Delete appliances in the facility building deduct of $5,668, and finally, to change the station platform canopy parapet walls from structural steel framing to insulated concrete form construction, and reduce also the, the 10 foot parapet height down to ten, uh, wow. eight foot, uh, a deduct of $105,000, for a total deduct of 149,281. Great, thank you. Any questions? Yes, sir, Director Salasev. Um, on the um, concrete columns, what, what will we replace that? And in replacing it, the concrete columns, what do you think the lifespan would be of switching that one to what you're proposing? So we're, what we're looking at is instead of uh, uh, these concrete columns are um, basically holding up a concrete uh, frame around the, par uh, the uh, uh, pedestrian entry access points at uh, the public sidewalks. And so 
uh, what those entries are doing is you're stopping the perimeter fence gates to either side. So we're, we're removing that portion and essentially uh, completing that area with uh, uh, the same material as the, the gate material um, uh, and fence material, which is aluminum. Uh, so as far as the, the uh, you, you asked, uh, lifespan. lifespan. Well, uh, it's the same material as what you have around the fen fencing right here around the parking lot. So um, 10, 15, 20, 20 years. It's, a, it's aluminum, not, not steel, so there's more uh, corrosion mm -hmm. resistance with that. So what, you're, what you have proposed before the deduct is a longer lifespan, in your opinion? It, it's, it's, a, it's a longer lifespan, um, yes, but... Um, uh, it's it, those those the, that it's a design feature that pretty much announces to the pedestrians that your these are your this is your entrance has your um, I guess RTA logo above it. Um, it it's it's a more uh, it's it's a it's a marker of sorts as as to where you ent you enter. Now we can we can achieve the same thing through the the uh, fencing. Um, System as well. You still think the lifespan would be less, somewhat? Yes, I mean concrete will will last much longer than saying. aluminum. Yes. I don't know about that. And then same question for item four, the one hundred five thousand dollar deduct. I'm assuming some of it's because of the lowering of the height from ten foot to eight foot. Correct. Uh, uh, so this is a, a design feature that we don't think will take away from the design intent. Um, from lowering the parapet heights from 10, to 10 foot to, to 8 foot. Uh, the higher you go, you've got uh, uh, wind forces um, to deal with, and so uh, we just think it makes sense to lower it, and it, it, shouldn't, it shouldn't affect the, the actual design intent of the project. And the lifespan? Lifespan, uh, no difference. In fact, uh, I, would, I would think that the uh, insulated concrete forms would, would outlast the, uh, the steel. Of course, the appliances, I guess, staff noted that they can probably buy them. Correct. Uh, the RTA would buy that uh, separately. Well, other than that one, I mean, I, I like all the other ones. I think they're fine. But I'd, I'd question the lifespan of any item if we're going to get a better product. But the $26,000, it seems like it's, you know. And I know you're, you're making suggestions, but I appreciate you being honest about it as well. Thank you. Sure. That's all I have. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you, sir. Thank you. That wasn't a vote, right? No. no. Okay. All right. Uh, agenda item 13, update on the shelter installations. All righty. Um, so just wanted to bring everybody up to speed on where we're at at this point in the installation process. This is the style of shelter um, that we have been placing out in the community. So basically, we have service standards. And as part of that process and part of that policy, we have um, items we look to for the shelter placement, basically. And I'll go, I'll go through some of them. Uh, to begin with, we look at ridership of 30 or more daily boardings or bus stops that generate at least 10 daily passenger boardings and are meet the following criteria. Where we've installed the ADA construction pads, Certainly, those are prepared for shelters. Um, if, when you have areas that have no pads or no sidewalks, certainly you cannot place a shelter. Um, medical senior citizen activity centers, uh, major employment centers, uh, major grocery stores, shopping centers, apartments, student dorm dormitories, uh, high schools, uh, frequent wheelchair uh, boardings, new major developments, major transport points and locations where waiting times for riders might be longer because we, the routes are less frequent. Okay, here's a map of our route system, kind of demonstrates where we have um, our routes located and which areas. We do have um, a few more routes in the central Port Ayers, Greenwood um, area. 
Here's a city map of the CDBG block grant area, which focus is, focuses in the low income neighborhoods, because certainly we want to ensure with Title VI that we are pro providing equal access to transportation and shelter amenities in that area. So the darker area that you see throughout there um, is where we have the lower income neighborhoods. Okay, so here's a summary uh, chart of where we have the top 10 PTNs and where we have the majority uh, of our shelters. We wanted to focus in certainly on ridership and then trip generators. Leopard Street, we have 41. Staple Street, we have 30. Now, these are only new shelters. This not, does not include the pre-existing um, shelters that are already out there. These are strictly the new 298. Uh, Alameda Street, we installed 20. Uh, Greenwood, we did put in 20. Ayers, 17. Port uh, Street, 15. Costores, 14. Gallagher, 12. Waldron, 12. And Morgan, 11. So we have 192 out of the 298 on the arterial streets. And then the other 106, we have them on other uh, streets as well. And I've got that slide that will follow this one. Uh, so we, the total there for the 192 and 106 is a 298. Now in 2020, we had purchased 40 of the 13 footers. Um, and then we had existing 186, which brings us year to date at 524 shelters. Basically, 38% of our bus stops have shelters, which is unheard of in the industry. Um, we are going to place by February of 2025 an additional 77 sets for total bus stop shelters, new and older stalls of 601. And at that point, we would be up to 44% of our bus stops having shelters, which is phenomenal. On this next slide, I won't go through each one. I wanted y'all to have the information. You can go back and look at it le later, but this is also where we have placed new shelters. So the next phase. Um, so currently we placed an order, purchase order number four, for the balance of the two-year base on this contract. So we have an additional 53 sh shelter sets coming in. Uh, and we expect to start getting deliveries for this order number four in August of this year. Benches 269, trash receptacles 121, solar lighting 53, two monitors, 228 of the beacon solar semi seats, which we will place in areas where we have limited right away. Um, as far as the option year, we have one more year on this contract once we fulfill purchase order number four. Uh, and in that particular option year, we have 24 additional shelters, 133 additional benches, 77 additional trash receptacles, uh, solar lighting, 22, 24, another monitor, and then 115 more seats. So next steps in this process. We are reassessing the ridership needs in the Hillcrest neighborhood now that construction is moving out of that area and the Route 12 will be reestablished over the next couple of weeks, and we've already started that process. Uh, we will look to start the installation for the beacon seats in August in areas where we have right-of-way constraints, such as Port Aransas, Robstown, Everhart, the Hillcrest neighborhood, and other Southside locations. I will bring the option year back to the Board of Directors in August for approval. And that concludes my presentation, sir. I have a comment. Uh, I just want to congratulate the team and you, Ms. Montes, on getting this done. As you all remember, when I got on two and a half years ago, that was my biggest complaint, concern, is that, and I, I didn't know the percentage nationwide, but I'm impressed also that that percentage is extremely high compared to other areas, and also that the locations that you put them on is based on the ridership. It's not discriminatory, yes. as far as mm -hmm. I can tell. Uh, I know that that's been addressed, but it, I, I don't see that. And I would like, uh, there's a couple of city council people specifically, um, 
uh, Ms. Campos that yes, sir. addressed that concern and she was not aware of all the progress. They, she is aware now, but I would appreciate if you could send her one or maybe the entire council, just this particular area, because she did address that as a concern. And I think Mr. Taylor, who's been a outstanding you. citizen of our community Absolutely. for many, many, many years and also served on this board, <laughs> to let him know that we are working on this and anything he can provide as uh, additional comments or suggestions would appreciate it. I'd appreciate it, yes, sir. Thank you for That's your comments. Thank you. Chair, and if you would, also send it to the county. Okay, yeah. sir. Yes, sir. Any other questions? Yes, Ms. Director Canales. Uh, one, also, I wanted to congratulate, you know, we are leading in the amount of, of shelters we have, but I did have, and I, you kind of addressed it, um, that you were going to reassess some of your criteria in some of the areas. Do we have a breakdown of, you know, like, for example, if one spot doesn't meet the criteria for whatever reason, let's say it doesn't have the 30 riders, but it has 25, and we're going for these new options, and you know we may not have riders in one particular area because of construction, how often do we reassess or we look at some of this stuff when, when something like that happens? Once the construction in the area is finalized, we'll go back in and reassess. Um, also, the other thing we're looking at is ridership is growing. Because of COVID, of course, we lost our ridership, and so that impacts placement numbers. So we look at other things as well. Are there new developments, uh, construction, housing in the area? So yes, Matt, to answer your question, we will reassess at different points, especially if there's a change in that area. So we will try to be uh, current with our assessment so that we know where we're placing our shelters, uh, they're needed, um, and that if there's any changes, we want to ensure that we address that as well. I, and I, and I, that was what my, I guess the basis of the question, um, that new station that we're building over off of Yorktown where Del Mar is, yes, and if, it, if you all haven't seen it, it looks really nice. Uh, I'm sure that we're gonna get a whole bunch of new ridership coming to that new campus, and I wanted to make sure we were able to include some of those shelters for people coming from different areas also. Yes, ma'am, we will look at that, thank you. I also thank just you. had a comment. Yes, I've been noticing more at night some of these shelters, the, how well lit they are. Were they, were the new installs always lit like they are now, or did we add some additional lighting? No, this is okay. the same lighting that okay. we've had. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you, though, for that. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Sharon? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Sharon. Sure. You're great, welcome. Great report. Thank you. Agenda item 14A, uh, uh, 2023, defined benefit plan evaluation. Good morning. So today's a day of consultants. I've got two more on the, on the line here for us. Um, we have Ms. Laura Stewart and, and Mr. Joseph Myers. Um, I know Mr. Myers has a prior commitment, uh, so I'm not, we were going to flip-flop the presentations just so we have enough time for Mr. Myers before he has to go. I'm not sure if that's how you all still want to do it. We, still, we have about 45 minutes before 1030. Laura, what do you think? Uh, I think we can proceed. Okay, so we'll proceed. Order. We'll proceed as, as normal then. So this is Ms. Laura Stewart. She's going to go over our defined benefit plan, um, and then Mr. Myers will go over the post-employment uh, benefits and other for the pension. You have the floor, Ms. Stewart. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time and the opportunity to present these results to you. Um, again, my name is Laura Stewart. I will present the defined benefit actuarial valuation results and Joe will present the OPEB results. And, and we are actuarial consultants from USI, and I did some math, and we're, we're at around 50 years of experience, so <laughs> um, happy to see that. Um, today, our presentation will not include a review of the investments of the defined benefit trust. Um, that is, those investments are managed by an, an official investment manager with principal financial group. So I just wanted to mention, while I will speak to the assets of the defined benefit trust, um, I do not manage those assets. Okay, um, first we'll talk through the 2023 DB plan valuation. So if you'll please turn to page four. Uh, first, we wanted to give a recap of the benefits that are covered under the plans, just so you can be familiar with um, the, the plan that we're talking about. Uh, first, the defined benefit plan is available to all employees. It does provide a monthly retirement benefit 
for the life of the participant and then a 50% benefit to the spouse um, once the participant uh, passes away. So this is a, a retirement benefit that uh, is defined as beginning at age 62, but participants can start receiving that benefit early. And the way we calculate that monthly benefit is by taking a formula that uses 2% times their years of service times their average pay. So there are a few components there that we track throughout their history, and that's um, the formula we use to determine the monthly benefit. Now, you do have to be employed with RTA for seven years in order to be fully eligible for your benefit. So while there's that benefit formula component, there's also, it's 20% it's per year um, once you've been there three years, so, so it's graded. Um, once participants reach retirement, they can choose optional forms. They don't have to take the 50% to the spouse option, um, but there are optional forms that we would provide to them at retirement. And this, this plan is funded through a trust, uh, meaning assets are set aside for the benefit of this plan. Any questions on the plan provision? Uh, unfortunately, this slide, um, this is you. Uh, this was a table with participant um, information, the number of participants in the plan. So I will speak to that at a high level and um, we'll make sure that everyone receives a copy without the table um, being to the side. Uh, on, the, on the valuation, we have active participants who are actively working for RTA. Uh, deferred vested participants who are terminated, um, no longer uh, working for RTA, who have not yet received benefits. And then we have retirees. And so overall, um, we, we track these participants. Uh, the overall plan size has increased by 23 participants to a new total participants of 639. So that's the total between the different groups. Um, this slide will also show average ages and the salary of the plan. Sorry. So what we do what? is we take the, oh, go ahead. Where is the 639 on this page? Because I'm seeing 218 and 185. It's, it's to the side, it's unfortunately it looks like on the screen the table is skewed so that you're not seeing the full table. Ah. So it just got a little wonky there, and the, t the total is not there, but there are 218 actives currently, 195 terminated but not in payment, and then 226 retirees. And so that total is 639. Got it. So one- Thank you. I just want to make sure I'm understanding this correctly. The 65,000 is what we anticipate the monthly cost will be for that 195? Yes, that's correct. So I'm just doing a little napkin math here, but we have 195 that we anticipate at 65,000, but 30 more people jumps that from 65 to 207 in terms of the monthly payment? Uh, the, the total retirees is, yes, 226, and that total monthly benefit payment is 206. Yes. Okay. I guess I'm just confused by how 195 is equivalent to 65 versus 226 being 226. It seems like a pretty big jump. Right, right. I will, I will double check that for you. Let's see. So that 206 is consistent with the total of the monthly benefits that are paid during the year. So I will double check the deferred vested. Um, now, I also will note many of those people are not 100% vested in their benefit. So those could include people who are only maybe 20% vested in their Got benefit. It. So that's that would where make you more might sense. Go. Okay, that makes sense. Because it's not apples mentioned. apples, that makes sense. Exactly, yes, yes. Okay, so when we're performing our evaluation, we take the, uh, the data and the plan provisions and we use certain assumptions to calculate the liabilities. So um, before we jump into the liabilities, let's talk briefly about the plan assets. Um, this table shows the activity of the market value, the trust of the plan. And as you would expect, RTA made contributions to the trust. 
And then those benefit payments, that $2.4 million for those retirees, that comes out. Now, what I wanted to point out on this table is the net investment income was a loss of $7.4 million. And that is approximately 15% of the total, total trust. So, wanted to, again, I'm not the investment advisor, but we know from, from reviewing all actuarial uh, plans, um, this is consistent with the investment loss that we've seen across the plans because 2022 was really an unprecedented year where fixed income or bond markets um, fell because as interest rates go up, the value of those bonds goes down. So fixed income results went down and equities, the stock market also went down. And so we just saw every, everything you invested in drop. Um, and so that's where we're seeing that 15% loss. But for calculating the annual contribution for the plan, we use a smooth value of assets, meaning you know, we're not looking at the market value, which is gonna bump up and down um, every year, we're going to have gains and losses. So to calculate that, that annual contribution, we will do that uh, with a smooth value to recognize that, that that kind of volatility isn't acceptable with the contribution. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Okay, here's the liability result. Um, this is showing 2022 and 2023. Uh, the top row shows the present value of benefits which is basically the, uh, as we project out um, everyone in the plan, meaning how long they'll work, what their salary is, when they'll retire, when they'll pass away. Um, we do include spouses in the valuation. If we project out all of those benefits, um, you can see the total present value of benefits is 59.3 million. But what's been earned as of 2023 is 53.5 million. And so we compare that $53.5 million liability to the assets of 46.8, and we see that the funded status of the plan, um, that's the ratio of the assets to the liabilities, is 87%. And that is a decline from last year's 94%. Again, primary driver of that is the investment return. One point here is the discount rate of 7%. Um, I wanted to point that out because this is tied to the investments. So what we do is uh, the, we work with the investment advisor who gives a recommendation of the long-term rate of return on the investment portfolio, and that's 7%. And so since the plan is funded, we're allowed to use that 7% as the uh, discount rate to calculate the liabilities. So they're tied together that way. Okay. This slide is just a pictorial of the benefits and the assets. Just pointing out the five-year funding percentage at the bottom, you can see it was 92% in 2019, and then had gradually been increasing um, to 94% in 2022, and then 87% in 2023. And again, we had benefited from, from some good asset returns over that period until 2022, and that's why we saw the decline. This next page is just showing historical contributions to the plan. Um, it is the funding policy of RTA to make annual contributions um, based on our actuarial calculations. Okay. Next, we'll show how we actually calculate that annual contribution amount. Uh, we've shown the results for 2022 and 2023 here. And I'll take a moment just to describe the pieces of the contribution. So the first piece is called the normal cost. This is the present value of the benefits that are earned during the year. And so you can think of that as the current cost of providing the benefits. And that was 1.1 million um, for 2023. Next, we take that unfunded liability, because again, we're 87% funded, so we're, we're not 100%. So we take that unfunded amount and we amortize that over 11 years. And that piece is 844,000. So the idea is if everything happened as expected, investment returns happened as expected, in 11 years, the plan would be 100% funded because you're making these annual payments of the unfunded amount to try to bridge the gap in the funded status. 
and that results is a total contribution of 1.95 million. Now we'll note um, the budgeted amount for the year was 1.4 million, and that was a number that was estimated before the investment loss. And so once we factor in the investment returns, that's where uh, the 1.9 is, is shown. Um, so that's something, the budgeted amount is not something that um, is, is easy to estimate. We do our best to estimate that, but actual investment returns will vary that from year to year. Okay. Next, um, just as a hypothetical um, situation, the current, again, the current annual contribution is 1.9 million at, with an 87% funded ratio. So we were asked to include um, what additional contributions would be needed to, to reach 90% on the, the basis of our valuation. So to reach 90% funding would, just to give you an idea, be around 1.5 million of funding and then to reach 95% would be 4.3 million. And again, this is in addition to the 1.9 that is already um, calculated for the year. So this just gives you some perspective on how much uh, would it take to get to these different funded percentages. And that concludes the defined benefit portion. Are there any questions on the DB plan? Yes, I do have a few questions. Director Mamie, please. On the, on the retirement age, you stated um, that the employees qualify for benefit at age 62? Correct. Is that? That's correct, um, they would receive their full benefit. Oh, sorry. That's considered the full retirement age? If, yeah, at 62, yeah, if you ha are fully vested at, se at the seven, seven years, yes ma'am. Okay. Correct. And they can also retire at age Go ahead. With a reduced benefit. At they can what age? retire at age 55 with a reduced benefit, yes. 5% a year for those Additional. up to 62 years old. So okay. correct. Now, I did ask you last time about um, since the spouse does receive the benefit after the employee passes, mm -hmm. but um, they are not included in the actuarial numbers. Is that something that we can include so we can so, be clear on our numbers? Laura, correct me if I'm wrong here, but that's an option. So you can option for your spouse too, and if you option to it, they're included in that actual number. And we do include, for, for, the, for the participants who have not reached retirement, we do include an assumption that they are married with a three-year, a spouse that's three years different in age. So we do go ahead and assume that they are married, but then once they retire and actually elect a benefit, then we use their actual marital status for the valuation. So we do include an assumption where there's no information known. Okay, and last question. You, if I understood this correctly, what, what percentage, I'll just ask the question, what percentage are we funded at currently? With the, the, the 1.9 that we are putting in, the 1.4 earlier, and the $523,000 that the board is approving today, will be funded at 87%. Okay. Which, that's right now that zero is because we're putting in the 1.9 together all together to give okay. us 87%. If we wanted to be at 90%, we'd have to put an additional on top of that 1.9 another one and a half million dollars. Okay. And we just wanted to put that slide in there and just for the board because I know we say our funding levels between 85 and 95% and target and I just want to let you know what it would cost us to be at that range. Yeah, so that was my question. I wanted to know if what we were approving in as far as additional funds, if that's what was getting us to the 87%. That was on the um, consent side over here, the $523,000, 340 I think is the yeah. other. Okay, that was all my questions. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Any other questions for Robert? Thank you very much. Okay. I guess we'll go to 14B, 2023 other post-employment benefits other than pensions. Mr. Myers. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, this plan is the uh, post-employment benefits, but it's really uh, the retiree medical plan. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, I'm going to give you a recap of the plan briefly. Um, so this is a benefit plan that, that covers uh, employees up until the age of 65 when they can receive Medicare. Um, the eligibility to get this plan is you have to retire uh, at age 62 
or be age 55 with 10 years of service. And it covers benefits until age 65. So this is a very short-term plan, whereas your pension plan is a $50 million plan. You'll see later that this plan is only about $800,000 of liability, mainly due to the short duration of benefits for each retiree. It covers medical, dental, and vision. The annual cost for a retiree would be around $18,000 a year, double that for those that are covering their spouse. Retirees and spouses pay much less than that, $3,500 a year, so about $300 a month. And spouses with family coverage, it's about $700 a month. There's not zero contributions, but they are small. And as a result of the contributions, we assume that around 25% of retirees who are eligible for this plan elect it. Currently, there are six retirees currently receiving benefits. And as I mentioned, once they turn 65 and can get Medicare, they are dropped from the plan. Does anyone have any questions on the actual provisions of the plan before I move to some other considerations? We do have one question. Yes. So the individuals are allowed to be on the plan until age 65 and get dropped after that from Medicare. If the spouses are younger, do the spouses get to continue on until they're 65? It's my understanding that the spouses drop at the earlier of the ages of 65. So once the retiree, if the spouse is younger, once the retiree hits age 65, the spouse would drop off. That's my understanding. So if the, let's just say, for example, because this happens very often, and it's a very big concern for individuals, especially at that age. The retiree is 65, no longer qualifies for benefits. So the spouses are not allowed to continue coverage until they're 65? But it covers both at the same time, so. Do you have an answer? My understanding, as documented in our report, I'll just confirm it while we're speaking. Spouse coverage terminates at the earlier of the spouse turning 65 or the member turning 65. So if the spouse is older, so if the spouse is older, the second the spouse turns 65, the employee loses benefits? Did I understand that correctly? No, the employee, the former employee who's now retiring gets benefits until 65, no matter, regardless of what the spouse's age is. The spouse coverage, their coverage ends either when they turn 65 or when the retiree turns 65, whichever comes first. Okay, so I'm gonna ask the same question because I'm receiving the same message. So if the spouse turns 65 first, the employee loses coverage? No, so if, I'll just give the example. If my wife was 65 and I was 62 and I had retired at 62, she would term out at 65, but I would continue for, till I hit 65, three more years. But it won't work the other way around. If I was 62, if I was 65 and she was 62, then she would term out when I turned out at 65. Okay, I think we should revisit that and it should be, it should include both spouses because that's a really big concern and a big decision. So I would like for us to look at that, to continue coverage for both spouses until age 65. Like I said, it's a low cost, so you're saying about $800,000 compared to a $50 million plan for the other, so we can start to look at some of those things. Okay. When we look at the big picture of all of our expenses, we'll keep an eye on that. Right, and then second question, do we offer Medicare supplement to the employees after they come off the insurance plan? That would have to be. No, it's my understanding this is a pre-Medicare medical plan. This is just to get you to Medicare, so yeah, it's. Okay, because when we're talking about benefits for the employees and they have such a rich medical plan their entire career, if they're here 30, 40 years, I think maybe looking into offering a Medicare supplement plan, I think would be to the employees. You know, we've got to take care of the employees. They give their lives and their years of service to us, and it's not a significant cost for Medicare supplement plans. They're actually very inexpensive compared to regular healthcare, 
um, that I think that that's something we should look You're at. You're talking to a, about a current employee or an employee who's a retired? retired? A retired. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we're looking at the pension plan and it's mm -hmm. got $50 million and one of the biggest expenses and concerns for retirees is health insurance. And, mm -hmm. and so if we're able to provide some type of Medicare supplement, it, when we're looking at cost, it's not going to be that much more. Well, again, we'll always look at entertain all options and, and kind of come to the board at some point in time and give you a cost of it and we can determine what we want to do. Okay. Thank you. Those were my questions. You could do that during the budget process, right? Yes, sir. <coughs> okay. One, one of the uh, um, comments uh, to look at was just talking about funding this plan. Currently, this, this medical plan, although it's, as I mentioned, it's a very small plan, is not funded. But I just wanted to give you some of the uh, considerations for funding the plan. Um, the advantages are that the retiree would have their benefits secured by assets. Um, and also, the, uh, the way it works is once a plan is funded, you can use a higher discount rate based on the expected asset return of the plan. So that adjusts the liability somewhat. And the funded plan would you know, improve your balance sheet uh, that you wouldn't just have an unfunded uh, liability on the books. Um, on the next page, just the disadvantages, you have to have a cash out outlay to pre-fund the benefits. Um, you have to, the assets would be restricted just for retiree benefits, and then you have to have an audit, um, and you have to have investment consultants, and there's time involved just going through all these processes. So my my, I wanted just to give you the information that it was, it was considered, but based on the size of the plan um, and, and based on the duration of the plan, which means it really ends when people turn age 65, um, it wouldn't be wise to, to worry about refunding this plan. You probably could use the money to, to true up the pension a little bit more. Um, here's the, the history of the last two years of the liabilities of the plan. As I mentioned last, last year, um, it ended at 834,000. Uh, we project, or we projected the current year to be 783,000. And the reason it went down is because there's a higher discount rate um, being associated uh, with the plan due to the higher, you know, higher rates in the market. So your plan is, has been stable at around 800,000. Uh, with rates, if they do stay the same, we expect the plan to grow by about fifty to one hundred thousand dollars a year going forward. Does anyone have any questions about either pre-funding or the liabilities? I just I have one more question yes, on the insurance plan. Is this separate than the um, the plan? The, the plan we're talking that, about? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Totally separate. Okay. What um, insurance? You know, do we have details on that plan? And why is it separate? Why is it carved out? This is this is more towards retirement as opposed to rolling as is an active em employee. So it, those are kind of just two totally separate uh, plans in here. Have we looked at combining them as far as cost or because? Um, so I just want to make sure we're on the same page here. So the first presentation that Ms. Stewart gave was just retirement benefits and not counting insurance. The second one here is the insurance uh, side of it here. So we could look and see how they mesh together, but uh, the, and I don't want to sound too formal when I say roll in. I'm sorry. Yeah, one is a pension benefit. The health and one plan. is medical coverage. Correct. So Yeah, so there, there's really no way to combine them. No, I'm not talking about the pension and the you medical. I'm talking about the health insurance that we have for the active employees mm -hmm. and then the health insurance for oh. retired employees. Like, why is that separate? Why are the employees the, uh, not included in the, the, in the retirees? Why are the retirees not included in the employee benefits? I think he's about to give a response here. The way it's accounted for is that <coughs> the retiree liability is, is put on the, the, so you have to have a specific retiree valuation because there's a liability associated with it that goes on the, on the on your financial statements. The active plan has no reserve. It's sort of a pay-as-you-go type basis. 
um, with the costs expensed each year, so there's no liability associated with the plan. So essentially he's, what he's plan. saying is we budget money for the health care plan, but if it goes above and beyond, which I'll show you in the financial statement a little bit, how that's kind of happening right now, we have to add to it. This is talking about funding something in here as opposed uh, to, to pay as you go, like the health care insurance is right now. This would be pre-funded something. No, right, I understand, but my question is, why are they separate? I, I know for uh, budget-wise, but why are the retirees not included in the current health plan that the active employees are? Because most companies include the, em the employees, the retired employees. The retirees are on the same... I believe, uh, and, and someone may need to correct me, I, bet they, I believe they get the same medical design as a pre-Medicare retiree? Till the age of 65, um, correct. But, yeah, but, but it's still 65, okay. but it really is a, this is a retirement benefit. So uh, retirement benefits are counted for differently. There's a liability set up for these retirees because this, this plan liability of 800,000 represents not only the six current retirees, but it's the future liability of the current active employees. So it's a liability associated with the plan with the retiree plan specifically. The medical plan, which covers the same medical benefits, I believe, is not pre-funded. There's no accounting requirements on it. It's just budgeted on an annual basis. So they're, they're treated a little bit different. This is a retirement plan, and that's why they're, they're presented with the pension. So just the expenses are carved out, but they're still, the retired employees are still in the exact same health benefit plan that the active employees are on. They you mirror that plan, correct. Okay. Thank you. That was my question. Yes. Any other questions? Yeah, and the next page just gives you a little bit of uh, longer history of the liabilities and how the interest rates changed. Uh, the rates have been pretty choppy. Uh, they bottomed out the last two years, and the most recent year it went back up. But as you can see, it's, it's been around $800,000 of liability. As I mentioned, once rates stabilize, it'll probably increase about fifty to 100000 a year going forward. And that's it for the presentation. Does anyone have any, any additional questions? Any questions? No, good. sir, I think we're good with that. Good to go. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, 14C, the March 2023 financial report. Okay, so this lines up with our board uh, priority of public image and transparency. So some of the highlights of the month, um, bus advertisement is doing well, 165 plus percent of baseline. Investment income with our higher interest rates right now is doing obviously well with, according to our baseline. And our Staple Street Center leases are just a little over 100%, so we're collecting our lease revenues. So operating revenues came in, uh, are projected, because we will get the March's revenues, our sales tax next week sometime. So. We're projecting to come in at about $4,043,000, and operating expenses will be a little shy of $3.6 million, so about $462,000 of positive cash flow for the, for the month. When you take a look at capital funding, about three hundred, almost $305,000 of capital funding, and then about um, $151,000, $152,000 of capital expenditures. So overall, we'll have about $615,000 um, of positive cash flow now. Some of it is transfers in because when we gave you the budget earlier in the year, it was, um, when we approved it in November, we had a deficit where we were having to transfer in about three hundred or so thousand dollars a month in there to balance our budget. So that's including that transfer in. Revenue snapshot, again, the first line item in there um, is our passenger uh, services. Obviously, we want most of these to be 100% or better. The only two below 100% are the passenger services, which is trending better, or we projected them better at least, at 96%. And our operating revenues, um, I'm sorry, our, our federal, state, and local grant assistance is about 10%. And that's because we just got our grant approved for our preventive maintenance money, which is about $800,000 of that money there. And then the other part of it is going to be um, our gas rebate that would come in here. So with our grant just being approved, this last month, we weren't able to put it in the financial statements here, but you'll see that money be made up during the course of the year. $304,000 is a transfer in that I was talking about to balance our budget. 
uh, when we gave you a balanced budget. So the total operating and non-operating revenues, including capital funding, is about $4.3 million for the month. Just where the money goes, purchase transportation, about uh, $719,000 at 22%. Miscellaneous, 2% at a little over $76,000. Supplies, um, $245,000, about 242, 243 of it being what it takes to run the bus, and then about 3,000 of COVID supplies. We still give out masks and some hand sanitizer from time to time. Salaries and wages are a little over 1.2 at 37%. Benefits a little shy of $600,000 at 18%. Services a little over $330,000 at 10%. Utilities a little shy of 52,000 at 2%. And then our insurance a little shy of $47,000 at 2%. That's just the uh, line items for the, the pie chart there. So total operating expenses of $3.3 million on a budget of about 3.36. So close to um, $300,000, I mean, about $60,000 in savings. Year to date, the numbers basically reflect the same as the monthly. Bus advertisement, again, 146,000, 146%. Investment income about 400, a little 400 percent, and then Staple Street leases at 100 percent of baseline. So our second column is our actuals. Total revenues, our operating revenues, are projected to come in at 10.6 million. Expenses about 10.4. If you notice the last two months in here, we were a little shy on the negative side because the first two months of sales tax is low. March starts kicking in. March and December usually are two bigger sales tax months. So with the bigger sales tax coming in here, now we're on the positive cash flow side of it here. So. We always take a deep breath the first two months, and then we start catching up during the course of the year. Capital funding, uh, we, we spent about $1.2 million. Capital expenditures, about $740,000, so about $458,000, so we're good on that. So total cash flow, about $628,000 for the year to date. Just the revenue line items. Again, the only two are same ones that are below the 100%, which is passenger services, our fares, essentially. And then our federal, state, and local grant assistance, which, again, will catch up as we start drawing down those preventive maintenance dollars. Again, the percentages are pretty much like they were on the month to date as year to date. It's only three months into it, and we're trending about the same. Expenses right now, we are, for the first three months, uh, a little shy of $9.6 million on a budget of almost 10.1. So we're about $500,000 to the good right now. It's our fair recovery ratio. So far, the first three months, we're trending at a 2.76%. Again, our sales tax for the last 13 months, as you can see, I said March and December are usually our two better sales tax months. First couple of months of the year usually tend to be a little lower. So February of 2022, our sales tax came in at 2.7 million. February of this year, came in at about 2.9 million dollars, so about 213 thousand dollars better than last month, last this month than this month last year. Our budget was 2.84 million, came in at 2.93, so about 91 thousand dollars better than what we budgeted. So good uh, trend right now for sales tax. And I'll take any questions. Any questions for Robert? <clears throat> I have one. Yes, sir. Uh, on the fair recovery ratio, if, mm -hmm. you wanna, if we go back to that slide yes, real quick, sir. is that, um, are those numbers for 2023, or I guess for 2022 and above, are those for the whole year, or is that to date as well? That's, so the first 18 to 22 is, is the year average, and 2023 is year to date average. So if I'm, if I'm reading this correctly, that means our fair recovery ratio for 2023 so far is higher than 2022's of the entire last year. Correct. But that could also fluctuate given ridership over the next few months and stuff. Yes, sir. Okay, Correct. thank you. Any other questions for Robert? Yeah, also on the fair recovery, mm -hmm. um, what months are included in that? Does that include spring break? For, so for the, again, 18 the to 2022 is six. all year long, 12 yeah, months, yeah. and the this two point seven three months, eight through March. Okay. So that includes one of our biggest ridership months when spring breaks here and everyone's moving around. Typically. Got it. So more than likely than not, 
that number goes, if nothing else changes, that number goes down towards the end of the year. As, yes, as right Based on historic is. averages. Now, a big part of it that, that carries it is we do contracts with Tamu and Del Mar, so that number stays the same whether the ridership is up or down. We get a set amount in there, so some of it's stagnant, static versus the other ones that will fluctuate a little bit. But, and yeah. then I think I asked about this at either the last meeting or the one before. What's the state average? A fair recovery ratio? Correct. Gosh, to tell you, prior to COVID, I can only tell you that because I, I haven't been keeping up with everybody during COVID right now, but prior to COVID, we were about 76.5% and everybody else was around 14%. So we were covering about half of what everybody else was. I'd be and there was people a lot higher than that. But. I'd be interested to see what the average is after COVID because yeah. We could start We've seen some of our ridership come back, which is really what I'm getting at. We've seen some of our ridership come back, mm -hmm. but our recovery ratio has gone down. So if our ratio is lower than 22 and 21, mm -hmm. and our ridership has come down, it, the only way you do that is we have extra fat in the system, or there's something that's driving up the cost, yeah, so because the more riders should be raising that rate in 22 and 23 versus 20 and 21. And it really depends on who's riding and when. So if our ridership rider, a lot of our riderships are bouncing back to the university, again, we get a set amount, so that will drive down your ratio in there because you get only certain dollars and you get more riders and they're not bringing in that much more income. Right. But I mean, our, our ridership in 21 was substantially lower than 22, correct? Correct. Yet our recovery ratio in 22 is lower <coughs> despite having much more riders. So I guess the question is, what has been added to the expense side that's bringing that number down? Because yeah. it should have just by pure numbers, it should be going up when we have more riders and more people doing the same fixed routes, but it's not. I think that's something we need to look at. Yeah, we could, we could dice that up at any point in time we want to. Thanks. Thank you for your shoot us an email, Robert. Okay, sir. Any other questions? All right, sir. Let's get on to 14D, the May 2023 uh, procurement update. I'll give you just a few more numbers and then and I'll be out of your hair. <laughs> so this lines up with the uh, board priority of public image of transparency. So these are all $50,000 or more. Uh, these are our formal procurements. We're looking at two diesel forklifts and about $150,000 for the two. It's a one-time purchase. Rebuilt transmissions, we're looking to exercise the first option the year, a little over $91,000. Internal, external uh, engine parts, we're looking at a one-year fixed contract, about $245,000. The occupational medical was the doctor center that we were talking about earlier, and when we talk about the cost of it here, about $100,000 for three years, so about $33,000 a year is what the RTA pays for that. Our MOA, that's the uh, agreement that we have with TAMU. Um, it's a two-year, about $150,000, so about $75,000 a year is our agreement with them. And then the purchase and restoration of our Clayburg Bank, we're in the third of the four um, RFPs that we put out. It should come back around July so we can go to committee if a proposal is, is submitted and we'll come back to the board in August. If no uh, proposals are submitted, then somewhere around July, late July, August 1st, we could submit it the fourth and final one for the six month period. So that'll put us to late January, early February when we come back and say our two year obligation of if the historical part is, is completed and we can move on forward if no proposals are, are submitted to, repur to repurpose that bank. So between the six there, we're looking at $586,383. Now this is CEO's outlook, so everything on here is under $50,000. Our actuarial services, Finley, now USI, that just presented $22,000 for a six month agreement. The real passenger information, which was uh, Transloc or tracking app, is about $45,000 a year. Elevator services, we're looking to exercise the final option year, a little over $31,000. Our fleet watch hardware, um, a three-year agreement, about $34,000 in a year, $11,000, $12,000 a year. I mean, $34,000 for a three-year period. And our interactive voice response uh, for our phone system in here, about $18,385. Altogether, $151,351. And everybody can guess the next slide is our marina space, about $6,840 that we pay a month for that one. All one right, thank you, Robert. Questions. Any questions? Yeah, I'm sorry, I got one. Can you go back to the occupational medical one? Yes, sir. How many employees are covered on that? 
So that's for every single one of our active employees. So 220 is? 224. Okay. So we basically break even, uh, sorry. If they go twice, if everyone goes twice, we win on that deal. It's a pretty good deal. As opposed to going to your primary grid. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Are for our pre employment uh, post tax. Uh, the occupational medical services is utilized for our pre employment uh, exams, our post accidents, randoms. So it's the services that we utilize Dr. Center for. It's not that every single employee goes every month or anything like that. Sorry, so that's not for the $300? Correct, that's okay, not. So no. We have two contract officers. Yeah. Okay. I'd be curious what the $300 contract is. Okay. Whatever that deal is, I'd like to see it. Thanks. We can get that information. All right. Great. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, Robert, you're off the hook. All right. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs> we got Derek now. Uh, agenda item 14E, the March 2023 operations report. All right. The board priority for this is public image and transparency. The highlights for the, the month are passenger trips were up 18% to 262,049. Our revenue service hours were up 5.7% and our revenue service miles were up 9.7%. Here you can see a, a graph of the ridership trend. I will say just as a to add on to Matt's comment. So March is actually kind of the, the middle of the run. We actually lose probably 10% of our ridership during the spring break period because at any given day right now, Del Mar, Tamu and the ISDs count for about 10 to 15% uh, there. So towards the spring you can see is actually, you know, that's the highest enrollment for the universities plus um, the fair weather, things like that. And that is actually our highest ridership period. But that doesn't affect the fair recovery ratio because it's a contracted rate, correct? It, for, for March, yes. We do see a little bit of drop off on our, on our other services and this, the students though pay, pay a reduced rate anyways for the ISDs. So, and that just, just kind of highlighting March kind of a middle of the run for our ridership. Got it. And then our, our system overall again was up 18%, but is down 38.4% compared to pre-COVID. Pre our fixed route system is up 17% for the month, but down 41.3 compared to pre-COVID. Our B-line services were up 10.9%, but they're down now 11.6% compared to pre-COVID. Our Flexi B services in Port Aransas were up 43% and up 8% compared to pre-COVID. Vanpool services were up 67.8% and up 119.2% compared to pre-COVID. And our rural services, which include Real and Pisano, were up 52.6% for the month, and they're down 38.9% compared to pre-COVID. And then year-to-date shows that our, our system is up 28.7% compared to last year, but down 39.5% compared to pre-COVID. Our fixed route system is up similarly 28.3% compared to last year, but down 42.2% pre-COVID. <laughs> and our B-line services were up 19.4%, but down 16.8% compared to pre-COVID. And again, our Flexi-B service in Port Aransas is up 61.5% year to date, and up 0.7% compared to pre-COVID now. Our van pool services, again, up 59.7%, and up 177% compared to pre-COVID. And our rural services were up 98.6% year to date and down 51.9% compared to pre-COVID. Here's our fixed route on-time performance. No issues here that I will highlight. We had a significant increase in our bicycle boardings for the month. This is a list of the, the projects that were impacted during uh, the month of uh, March. I will highlight that the uh, Leopard from the Nueces de Bay, Bay de Palm uh, did reopen this week, so we have begun servicing part of that Leopard. And then on Friday, Winnebago should open up to us and we'll be begin resuming normal, ser re somewhat regular service through the Hillcrest area. This is a list of the upcoming bond projects that will be impacting our services. And for the, here's our B-Line service performance. They were just below the standard at 2.44 for passengers per hour, and a bulk of that issue is occurring on Saturdays and Sundays now with the, the cancellation rates. On the weekdays, we're far above the 2.5, then we see, like say on Sundays, sometimes it's almost uh, half of the, the trips get canceled. 
And then the miles between road calls are way above the standard at 20,000. We did have 19 customer assistance forms, but I will say that we had five accommodations for our uh, operators, which was uh, one of the highest numbers we've had in quite some time. And then our miles between road calls for the large bus fleet was uh, significantly above our standard at 26,000. This is actually the highest since I believe 2014 that we've achieved on our, our big bus fleet. With that, I'll answer any questions that you have. Any questions for Derek? Thank you, Derek. Yeah, just one. Go ahead. Uh, go ahead. Yes, sir. This, Derek Coleman. I want to go back to this marine. Would you please turn on your mic, sir? It's on. Oh, I'm sorry. I couldn't hear you. You can't hear me? <laughs> <laughs> the marina boat uh, slip, do we, ha are we, do we have a ferry or something I don't know about? We've maintained it because it's the largest slip they have there. And if we were to give it up, then we wouldn't have it if we wanted it for, for any potential services down the, so the road. So is that in the plan, I mean, to, to utilize that? Uh, discussions come up across the community every once in a while. We did, as part of our long range plan, they did do a study of that and it showed the significant costs and the community involvement we would need if we were to move forward with that. Okay. So that there's no, no set plans at this time. I would like, Chairman, if we can get an update on that. I mean, it, it, I don't know how long it's been in, not in, in there a long time. A long time? Yes, sir. Well, a long time needs to maybe come to time. We, yeah, we need to talk to the city. People. Oh, the city. Uh, Director okay. Coleman, I know at one time I had asked the staff to look into maybe a potential private uh, slash kind of a joint between us and a private investor and see if that might be an avenue that we could we could try and find a way to use that slip. I don't know where we're at on that, but I know we were th we had talked about it at some point saying that we were going to see if there was anything we could been paying on it and need to be figured well, out. So we can follow up that a previous they, they've changed um, leadership at the marina a couple times. Since our last discussions, that one of the previous um, directors over that the marina wouldn't allow subletting the the, lead, the dock, so we were pretty much stuck holding it. But we can revisit that with the, the city and see if we can do that. Thank you, Director Coleman. Any other questions? Hear none. Thank you, Derek, very much. All right, agenda item 14F, uh, the January through February 2023 safety and security report. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Again. Um, okay, so um, January, February, and March, uh, three months. Uh, as you can see, uh, we did well on, in, uh, on the red, which is a zero uh, preventables. And then we hit a bump in, in March. So um, January was uh, 1.48, 1.53 in February, and March 1.9. But uh, year to date, we're a little bit better than last year. We're at 1.66, as you can compare to 1.72. And those three months, we had a little over 1,000, uh, 154 uh, contacts. Uh, again, 70% is uh, quality of life. That's the uh, officer friendly that we have attitude at, at the transfer station and our, on our rovers and security guards. Uh, continue doing well with the public. Staples Street Center, uh, Officer Perry and uh, Sabian do the uh, evening and uh, midnight shift. They're doing well, very well supervised by Lieutenant Lee and continue doing uh, well with the Rock Sound uh, K-9 unit, uh, police department and precinct five. Uh, like I said earlier, we're doing two to three every month. Um, and then on the, on the Rover, uh, continues to do well uh, out in the, um, in the community uh, also assists uh, CCPD um, in uh, major traffic accidents and uh, incidents that they have throughout the city and also uh, does well in our uh, bus routes. Questions? Any questions for uh, Mr. Rendon? All right, we're good. Uh, you want to do your uh, CEO report, please? Yes, sir. Okay, so uh, in ridership increased by 18% compared to April of 2022. We had new uh, six hires. The shelter expansion program, like you heard earlier, is, is doing well. And at the Del Mar uh, Super Stops, the one in York County is 95% completed. I would say a little bit more. It's just landscape and stuff that ne needs to be done. 
and then on the rock fill is 70 percent uh, completed for the air transfer station construction um, and the forecast is uh, it should be done by the first quarter of 2024 early part of next year and I uh, just want to say thank you for all the uh, board of directors who were able to attend uh, the conference, CTA conference, uh, a couple of weeks ago. And then I attended a statewide meeting in Austin with Tex21 and uh, myself, uh, Derek, Michael, and uh, Mario attended the uh, mobility conference in, in Minneapolis where we received those two awards. And then uh, we had the Employee Appreciation Day, April 6th. Um, a lot of goodies w were given to, to our employees and TDA conference volunteers. We had a, a great lunch um, sponsored by uh, HR. And also I just want to say thank you to the working bees. As you see in the middle picture, they did uh, awesome work for, the, uh, for us, represented the company well. And I would just want to say again, thank you very much. Uh, and the upcoming CCRTA picnic, <coughs> June 25th, it's a Sunday at Westwood Pavilion. I remember we used to have them when I was sitting where you guys are sitting, and it, it went well for the RTA family. And for whatever reason, we haven't done one in about 15 years, so I told HR, let's work on it, and, and uh, our managing directors, they're all in it. And uh, I believe Robert volunteered to do some uh, barbecue uh, hamburgers and hot dogs for the employees. Thank you, Robert. Uh, yeah, so that's going to happen. <laughs> so that's going to happen Sunday, <laughs> June 25th. And we continue um, putting ourselves, our faces, and the community representing the board well. Uh, we had 20 community outreach events. So you can see uh, Live, Learn, uh, Lead, Career Day. We had touched a truck with the Junior League and then the Go Pass presentations with people with disability. And then we did have a free fair uh, Earth Day uh, with a mobile app. And then the upcoming events, uh, Buck Days this weekend, um, and then the uh, uh, Small City Emergency Preparedness presentation May the 11th, which is next week, Beach to Bay May 20th, Board of Directors Committee meeting May 24th, Memorial Day, Reduction of Service, May 29th. And then our next Board of Directors meeting is June the 7th. And then, uh, of course, June 25th on the CCRTA picnic. That's it. All right, thank you. Any questions for Mike? Okay, hearing none, uh, it's 10.43. And under sections 551.071 and 551.074, the Texas Open Meetings Act, the Board of Directors will be going into closed session in order to discuss agenda item 16, discussion and closed session on A, the selection of a new CEO and possible action thereafter in open session, and B, consultation with legal counsel concerning matters involving attorney-client privilege, including legal issues related to legislation pending or contemplated in the 88th Texas legislature with possible action thereafter in open session. 1043.
eleven twenty two. We're back in the regular session. No votes were taken in closed session. And I don't have the memo here to read us back in, but we're back in open session at eleven twenty two. All right. Having said that, uh, I don't think we're going to have any uh, action items today. Sixteen. So seventeen board chair report. I'm going to go back to. The courtesy, we'll start on the left-hand side. Aaron, you got anything to, you want to say, please, sir? I just want to, uh, as always, thank staff and, uh, you know, thank you for all the great work that you're doing. You know, we obviously have a, a lot of great things to be very proud about, so I'm just, uh, it's, you know, it's an honor to be a part of this board and to be a part of this organization, so thank you all. Director Coleman. Director Salsa. All good. Thank you, staff. Good job. Um, I would just like to thank the staff. There's a lot of things that have been moving forward, a lot of uh, activities in the community, a lot of projects that um, we are uh, moving forward with. Thank you um, for all your hard work. Madam Vice Chair. Nothing new for me. Good job, B team. Proud of you guys. <laughs> Mr. Armando. Thank you to all staff, uh, especially uh, you know the the staff that keeps us informed with all the emails and it, it it's it's a lot to read i can just imagine it, what it is to produce so once again thank you for all the hard work um i'm just so proud to be part of an organization that strives for greatness um all the awards that the employees get everything that you all do is just so impressive and it's something that i think everybody should be looking at the rta on the work that you guys are doing so congratulations just to reiterate thank you staff very much uh, I got to attend the rodeo, the, the rodeo rodeo on that Saturday. Those guys can drive those buses. Man, they're very good, extremely talented. Um, other than that, I don't have anything else. Um, any other business before our uh, RTA Board of Directors? Hearing no other business, I'm adjourning the meeting at 1124.